Hello lovely people, how are you today? It's Brendan Thomas Marrett and you're here for part 26 of 40 in the End Times series. So in Revelation chapter 14 verses 6 to 13, three angels are sent to the earth to give grave warnings. The first one proclaims the gospel of the kingdom. Remember the gospel of grace, the gospel of the church age, the gospel of the blood, cross, and empty grave of Jesus ends with rapture. This gospel is the gospel of the kingdom, that a common kingdom is on the way, a kingdom that will defeat evil and will not tolerate the darkness. A second angel declares, Fallen is Babylon, kingdom of the Antichrist, because it's very, very typical in prophecy to call something in the future as though it is. And then the third one beseeches the people of the earth not to take the mark of the beast. Now we have looked at the gospel of the kingdom before, but just in case you forget, here are the cliff notes. One was saved into the gospel of the kingdom by believing in the identity of Jesus. Water baptisms are essential for the forgiveness of sins, unless it's a case like where you know you physically can't, like you know you die a few minutes later. <laughs> they will be the believers who experience the wrath of God on the earth the day of the Lord, the tribulation. They will be the believers who experience the kingdom of God on the earth, Christ as king. The primary revelation is the identity of Christ as David's greater son, ushering in an Israel-centric kingdom. Gentiles were typically seen as enemies and not as equal in Christ, though there were a few exceptions. In this rule, God fulfills the covenantal promises and he elevates Israel to the premier nation on earth. These believers live under the Mosaic, that is Moses' law of blessings and curses, Cuff, cuff, Ananias and Zephira, hello. <laughs> this dispensation can accurately be called the Bride of Christ. They worship God in synagogues and in temples, especially in the big temple in these days it will be rebuilt. The nations get blessed through Israel. And God's age-old plan, made known to the prophets from as early as the Tower of Babel and the calling of Abram. Genesis 10 describes the division of the nations. Genesis 11 tells you why it happened, the Tower of Babel. And in Genesis 12, it's revealed that the Lord had already called Abram to go for a walk and to create the nation the Lord would actually set up as the spiritual hub on the earth. And repentance was repeated throughout one's life. Not something that stopped just because you came into the revelation knowledge of the cross. Now Revelation 14, 12 calls for patient endurance. And again, it harkens back to that notion of the blessing that comes to the one who overcomes in Revelation 1, 2, and 3. The one who does not get the mark of the beast. The one who does not worship the idol of desolation. The one who does not succumb to the big lie of those days. 
because great and incredible blessings await those who go on believing, even if it means on to death during the Great Tribulation. You have a reread of Revelations, um, sorry, Revelation chapters 1 to 3, um, or even have a look at Hebrews 14, 14 to 15, they give you a cheeky little preview of what's coming down the pipeline. Even if it means death, being stabbed, being beheaded, it is still better than getting the mark of the beast and worshipping the idol of desolation. But Jesus despises what the Antichrist's regime does to his people. As in Revelation 14, 14, he's referred to as the Son of Man. The Son of Man is one of the names Jesus uses when he's going to administer vengeance. For example, in the book of Daniel, which is an excellent book in terms of end times prophecies, you can look at chapter 7, verse 13 to 14. In my vision at night I looked, and there before me was one like a son of man, Jesus, coming with the clouds of heaven. He approached the Ancient of Days, also Jesus, and was led into his presence. The Son of Man was given authority, glory, and sovereign power. All peoples, nations, and men of every language worshipped him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion that will not pass away. And his kingdom is one that will never be destroyed. Amen. And again in Revelation 1.13, he's also referred to as the Son of Man. But he's not standing there all just looking all holy and sweet, meek and mild. No. <laughs> the sound of rushing waters is all around him. Um, and in his mouth. There's a double-edged sword. He's coming for war. He's coming for battle. Revelation 14, 15 says an angel exits God's temple, the, the temple in heaven, and shouts, Take your sickle and reap, because the time to reap has come, for the harvest of the earth is ripe. So basically, it is time to repay those who have done evil in the sight of the Lord. Verse 17, another angel comes out of the temple in heaven, and he too has a sharp sickle, ready for war. And the Ark of the Covenant is also in the temple. The temple as it is described in Solomon's day is a picture of the temple in heaven. Obviously the one in heaven is bigger and better and more amazing because it is heaven. <laughs> um, but it's it's absolutely incredible. It's just the most phenomenal place. Uh, but it's got staff, especially angel staff. And uh, it's even got an altar as well. That's where uh, at the fifth seal, the tribulation martyrs, um, stand begging to be avenged. But these angels, they're not your typical <laughs> big cheeked, big bummed, kneecap high, um, cartoon angels that you see on like, you know, TV advertisements. These ones despise wickedness, and they are coming to put the wicked to shame on the earth. They're harvesters. You can read all about what they do in verses 14 to 20, but it's not the first time that they're mentioned. In Isaiah 17, 4 to 6, it says, in that day the glory of Jacob will fade, the fat of his body will waste away. It will be as when a reaper gathers the standing grain, 
and harvests the grain with his arm, as when a man gleans heads of grain in the valley of Rephaim. Uh, Rephaim is uh, one of the Nephilim. Yet some gleanings remain, as when an olive tree is beaten, leaving two or three olives on the topmost branches, four or five on the fruitful boughs, declares the Lord, the God Almighty. So the wicked will be pillaged and massacred, but Lord always reserves a remnant. Okay, Isaiah twenty four thirteen. So will it be on the earth and among the nations, as when an olive tree is beaten, or as when the gleanings are left after the grape harvest. Very similar language. Jeremiah fifty one <clears throat> thirty three. This is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel, says. The daughter of Babylon is like a threshing floor. At the time it is trampled, the time to harvest her will soon come. Dun, 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 dun. Hosea 6.11 As for you, Judah, <laughs> a harvest is appointed. Whenever I would restore the fortunes of my people, Whenever I would heal Israel, dot, dot, dot. Joel 3.13 Swing the sickle, for the harvest is ripe. Come, trample the grapes, for the wine press is full, and the vats overflow. So great is their wickedness. Nuts, absolutely nuts. Matthew 13, effectively you can read from 24 all the way to 43, but it refers to prophecies in which the Lord sends harvester angels at the right time to cut up the deception, to tear it to shreds, so that those who know the truth, who hear the truth, will stand, and those who've been given over to the darkness will get what is coming to them. The angels do not act independently, though. Jesus is also there in the sky, waving his sickle, massacring the wicked. And the angels just copy what he does. Inside the temple, in verse 18, we're told that there's an angel in charge of heaven's temple's fire. <laughs> <laughs> he keeps it lit. Why? Well, Leviticus 6, 11-13 says, Then he shall take off his garments, put on other garments, and carry the ashes outside the camp to a clean place. And the fire and the altar shall be kept burning on it, it shall not be put out. And the priest shall burn wood on it every morning, and lay the burnt offering in order on it. And he shall burn on it the fat of the peace offerings. A fire shall always be burning on the altar, it shall never go out. Again, what happens on the earth is a picture of what happens in the spirit world. This angel in heaven, literally that's his job, keeping that fire lit. <laughs> Leviticus 9.14 God himself lit the fire. And because of this, it became holy fire, as though the hand of God touched it. It was never allowed to go out. It had to be fed constantly to keep it from going out. The fire of God was always with them, continuously in the pillar of fire above and below. They carried it with them wherever they went. At this point, the angel says, take your sharp sickle and gather the clusters of grapes from the earth's vine because it's grapes are ripe. The time has come to execute major judgment. In verses 19 to 20, the angel swings his sickle, gathers his grapes and threw them into the great winepress of God's wrath. There they trampled in the winepress outside the city, and the blood rose as high as a horse's bridle and flowed for as many as three hundred 
kilometers. So insanely wicked and evil will that generation be that this is the only way to preserve a remnant of believers on the earth. Absolutely horrific. You would not see a horror movie with what is going to be this kind of deception it's, or this kind of attack. Um, and it's it's heaven fighting back against wicked evildoers because the wicked evildoers initiated it first. <laughs> um, but absolutely heinous. Don't screw with God. Do not make God your enemy. Um, because he always has a bigger army. He always has more power. Uh, and that's not a threat to the body of Christ, but talking in, in general, um, especially in the end times, he will not be mocked. He will not let the earth be destroyed by the forces of evil. Oh, it will obliterate in an instant at one point. <laughs> and that's when he decides to roll it all up like a garment. Not some man who's just tiptoeing round with uh with, with, with demons thinking that he's some super special awesome hotshot not realizing that they despise him and are just waiting to drag him into hell <laughs> but uh scary very very scary messed up gory bloody terrifying but necessary necessary to preserve life and the ones who actually want to live and deserve to, who aren't killing anybody. Yeah. I don't know what else there is to say on that one. I'm just going to let that sit there. <laughs>